We're at Lecture 51, uh, Math 241. We had an interesting problem yesterday. It kind of started from a web assigned question, although we went kind of beyond what the web assigned question was. But we did a problem two different ways, and the answers were off by a factor of one fifth. And uh, that kind of bothered me. Uh, actually, it woke me up this morning about 5.13. Uh, and I didn't get back to sleep. So I kind of like that stuff that tells you how geeky and nerdy I am. That uh, if you do a problem two different ways, for goodness sakes, you ought to get the same answer both ways. In fact, I did it a third way um, yesterday. And I think I have justified why one has the factor one-fifth in it and the other one did not. And in fact, I think I've got all three ways of doing this problem justified now in my mind. Uh, if I can convey that to you, I don't know, but I, I will make an attempt. So let's rectify that situation first, and then we'll go on further with uh, Taylor and McLaurin series. So we had previously um, come up with a power series for inverse tangent of x, and we decided that we were going to use that result for inverse tangent. I think it was x over 5. Um, I looked it up in the book, and there's a problem similar to this in the book, but it's x over 3. But I think the web assigned homework that we dealt with was x over 5. Uh, inverse tangent of x on its interval of convergence looked like this. We had developed that from uh, integrating 1 over 1 plus x squared. No correction factors are necessary there. Uh, we decided that everywhere there was an x on the left side, if we replace that with x over 5, then basically that compels us to do the same thing on the right side. which this should be the correct answer, okay, this substitution. So we should get this factor of one-fifth that we did the problem another way uh, was missing that factor of one-fifth, and I think we can, we can justify this. So I, th I think this is the correct answer, and let's look at it two other ways that we looked at it. We went ahead, and instead of integrating one over one plus x squared, with respect to x, which gets us inverse tangent. We decided to use the same approach that got us that formula that's listed at the top of this page. Now, without getting back to the same potential problem that we had yesterday. Uh, when you have something here that is not x, the quantity squared, and then the derivative of x, we decided that we needed a, for this to integrate to this, we needed a one-fifth dx. So this should integrate to inverse tangent of x, Here's what we actually did to get there, to the, to the best of my recollection, which, by the way, couldn't I take that one-fifth that's present and move it out in front? This is what we actually did. We got a power series for 1 over 1 plus x over 5, the quantity squared, then we integrated it, and that's how we got the other answer, which was instead of x over 5, it was x there. Uh, instead of x over 5 cubed all over 3, we were missing a factor of 5 there in the denominator. Basically, 
we got the same series, but we got it times five. There is what we did not do in that series. So we got an answer. Let me see if I can find that answer. Well, I was trying to kind of say, well, we didn't really have that. We didn't. We didn't. Here's what we had because of how we went about it, and we didn't have that correction factor. So let's go back and do that. Okay. Here's what we did, and we called that 1 minus negative x squared negative the negative of x squared, x over 5, the quantity squared. It's a lot easier to deal with when it's just x squared, but we've got x over 5. So we decided that that was the first term, and that was the ratio. So we got that. Notice no extra one-fifth in there, no extra five in there, just that. And we decided that was the first term was one, and the ratio was negative x over five, the quantity squared. If that's not what we had, it should have been what we had. Now, we decided that's not what we wanted. What we wanted was the integral of that. So therefore, we had to integrate this. Here's where we had the problem, where we got an x, and we got a, um, that 5 squared is a 1 over 25. And then we integrated x squared, which was x cubed over 3. This was a 1 over 5 to the 4th, which was 625. And we integrated x to the 4th, which is x to the 5 over 5. This is what we compared to the other one. And it was very clearly, here we had an x. And on the other one, we had an x over 5. So it seemed like we were missing that factor 1 fifth. Well, this isn't really what we found the first time. It's 1 fifth of what we found the first time. Because in order for this to be the inverse tangent of, act of x over 5, it has to have a 1 fifth in there. We never did deal with the 1 fifth. So what we really found was 1 fifth. So here's what we found. Okay, We need to multiply it by 1 fifth in order to make it equivalent to what we were actually trying to find. So that one got me pretty much justified. But what also came to my mind is <coughs> this. Remember, we did uh, inverse tangent integrand. We were doing the table of integrals in, uh, at the end of 141. And we decided that anything in this form was that, OK? And most of you probably memorized that. That's something that is used enough. Uh, that was an a squared, sorry. So if that's something squared, and that is the variable quantity squared we're integrating with respect to u, it integrates to this. <clears throat> well, we can kind of knock out the plus c, because we're going to have a plus k that we decided on the inverse tangent problem was 0 anyway. So let's set that aside. What if we had, this might be even better than the way I worked it out um, yesterday. What if we had that? Because that's kind of what we generated that one time. How would that translate back to an integrand? Well, if that's 1 over a, 
inverse tangent of u over a, that to me says that where I have an a, I should really have a 5, right? And where we have a u squared, we should have an x squared. So if that's what we really wanted to get for an answer, it ought to look like this. Suppose I took the numerator up here, and I'm going to try to get it in the form. Here's the form I'm kind of gearing toward right here. If that's the form I'm headed toward, and I've got a 5 squared there, I'd better divide everything by, what, 25? So if I divide that by 25, 25 down here by 25, and x squared by 25, so I haven't done anything that requires any compensation. It's numerator, same thing, it's denominator. So if I call that 1 and call this x over 5, that's looking a whole lot like what we did. And this I can call 1 again as long as I do what with that? Bring the 1 over 25 out in front. So is that... Here we've got, I, don't, I didn't like the fact that I went the other way this time, but we've got a 1 fifth and a 1 25th out in front. There again, we've got that factor of difference of 1 fifth from what we generated. So this is really all of this. And what we have is, in essence, 1 fifth of this. Is that okay? I, this isn't, didn't, I don't like it this way. I did it actually another way. I started with this and worked my way back to this. I like that better. But it, is this thing that we started with, this result that we have down here, isn't it one-fifth of this? <coughs> because here we've got a factor of one-fifth out in front. Here we've got a factor of one-twenty-fifth. It's a fifth of, in essence, what we found. So by all three of these, I think we can justify that the inverse tangent of x over 5 is the simplest way that we did it. Everywhere there was an x in the inverse tangent formula, all we have to do is substitute an x over 5. That is the correct answer. And what was that? x over 5 cubed over 3, x over 5 to the fifth over 5, and so on. That's the correct answer. I can tell that you're not quite as justified in your mind as I am in mine. Uh, but I did basically work the problem three ways and got the answer to be the same all three ways. So we were missing a one-fifth in the other problem. It's probably... Here's what we did. We found this. We integrated it. It's, it's missing a fifth. Because in order for this to be an inverse tangent, it has to have a one-fifth. So we found this. It's really one-fifth of the inverse tangent. Not a test question, but I, I think that stuff, that especially when we can connect it to a formula that we've had prior in this class is probably a pretty good thing to do. All right, we ended yesterday with a Taylor series for e to the x. Actually, it's a Taylor series, instead of being centered at x equals a, it's centered at x equals 0, which technically makes it a Maclaurin series. But you can call any of these Taylor series. Taylor series are things that look like this. We have higher order derivatives. 
at A, nth derivatives, at A, over n factorial, x minus A to the n. And if we let it start at zero and run forever, then it actually is equal to, we're going to talk about today a little bit about stopping it at a certain number, how it approximates that function. And any time it approximates a function, then we have to talk a little bit about error, or at least the upper bound for the error. If we're stopping it at uh, the 13th derivative and 13 factorial and the binomial to the 13th power, what kind of potential error do we have for e to the x or sine of x or cosine of x or inverse tangent of x or, or any other function? Right now, we're going to let it run to infinity. So for this, we let our a value be 0. So we converted so x minus 0 is just x. So when we put in higher order derivatives, the derivative of e to the x is itself, so is its second derivative, third derivative, all the derivatives down the line. And when we evaluate all those derivatives at 0, e to the x evaluated at x equals 0 is e to the 0, which is 1. So that doesn't change from one term to the other. So this became 1, right? All the higher order derivatives at 0 were all 1. So if we have x to the n over n factorial from n equals 0 to infinity, we have a power series, certain type, a Taylor series, for e to the x. I think that's probably about where we ended. So the first term ought to be x to the 0 over 0 factorial, which is 1. x to the 1 over 1 factorial x to the 2 over 2 factorial, x to the 3 over 3 factorial, and so on. So we didn't kind of see if we think it's believable. I mean, it seems to, to work in this case where all the higher derivatives at 0 are all 1. Pretty simple version of this. If this works, Just writing the same thing down again so we have it on this sheet. Let's see if it works for when x is 1. Well, when x is 1, so I'm plugging in a value for x. Everywhere I see an x, we should plug in a 1. We're supposed to let it go forever, but let's just stop it at this term and see how well we're doing. We know e to the first is approximately 2.718. So we've got a 1 plus a 1. There's a 2. There's 1 over 2 factorial, which is 1 over 2, which is 1 half. There's 1 cubed over 3 factorial, which is 1 over 6. There's 1 over 24, and there's 1 over 5 factorial. What is that, 120? So we're supposed to let this go. But the terms are getting pretty small. The next one is, what, 1 over 720? So we're going to have some error, but let's see how well we're doing at this point. We're supposed to get 2.718, roughly. If we add these together, where are we at this point? Not bad. So we're missing a whole lot of terms. But we're still doing pretty well, um, basically truncating this. That's called a Taylor polynomial as opposed to a Taylor series. Series means we're going to let it go to infinity. A Taylor polynomial says we're going to stop it at a certain n value. 
but we did okay in this case. Suppose we wanted, uh, let me give you a reason for wanting it first. Let's suppose that we were wanting a way to integrate that. Could we do that integration problem by substitution? A few of you are shaking your head that we could not. Here's the attempt. If we were going to use this by do this by substitution, it'd be e to the u. u would be negative x squared. Here's where I think the problem comes in. What's the derivative of u? We don't have an extra x floating around in the integrand. We can't create one ourselves because it's variable. Uh, so this method is not going to work. How could we do this problem? Well, we have a Taylor series, a power series, for e to any power. How about let's get a Taylor series for e to the negative x squared, and let's integrate that. So if that's e to the x, again, I'll just write this down. We want something for e to the negative x squared. How do we do that? Same thing we did with the inverse tangent of x in coming up with the inverse tangent of x over 5. Everywhere there was an x, we put in an x over 5. Everywhere there's an x, we want to replace it with what? Negative x squared. So now we have this way of writing e to the negative x squared as this power series as a polynomial type thing. Polynomials are always a lot easier to deal with than things that aren't some type of transcendental function. Polynomials will always be easier. So we've got 1 minus x squared. Let's see what we've got here. Plus x to the fourth over 2. Uh, what? Negative x to the sixth over six. Granted, it's not all of them, but we've got the pattern going here. So if we want to integrate this, we should be able to integrate this side and accomplish the same thing. So you can write something out that appears to not be integrable by methods that we've studied to this point in time, patterned integration. And we can integrate it in pieces in the series form. So the integral of 1 would be x, the integral of this, x cubed over 3. Here we've got a 1 half, and then we'll integrate that, x to the fifth over 5. Here we've got a minus 1 sixth, x to the seventh over 7. So something that by normal means is not integrable, convert it to a series, it is integrable at that point. So we do need to keep it going in order for that equation to be maintained. Um, we probably shouldn't leave e to the x until we do this. So we have e to the x written as a Taylor series, Maclaurin series, some type of power series. We ended up trying to do a problem the other day, an inverse tangent problem. We went outside of the, inver of the interval of convergence and it didn't work. Uh, so we better see if that possibly could happen with this particular power series. How are we going to find an interval of convergence? How 
how did we there are different ways that these In, types of series can converge. They can converge for a single value like at, at x equals 0 or at x equals 3, a single value of x only. They could converge for all values, negative infinity to positive infinity, and they can um, converge for some interval. So how did we figure out, how did we come up with that interval of convergence? Ratio test. Ratio test. So let's take this thing right here and do a ratio test and see what is the nature of the convergence for this particular series. So we want the limit, so we're doing a <coughs> ratio test to try to find when this particular power series converges for e to the x. So we want to see what happens way out there to the right. What's in the numerator? We haven't done a ratio test for several days. n plus first term. So if the description of the term is x to the n over n factorial, then the n plus first term would be x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial. Uh, let's get rid of the complex fraction. So we'll multiply by the reciprocal of the denominator. Okay, tell me what things kind of knock out numerator and denominator. What's left where? Okay, and that happened because n plus 1 factorial is really n plus 1 times n factorial. Is that right? So the n factorials reduce, so that's correct, and n plus 1 in the denominator. And how do they reduce? Leaving what? Where? X in the numerator. So this numerator has x to one degree larger than the denominator, so you can reduce them, but it leaves an x to the first in the numerator. So we don't know what x is. Let's keep the absolute value notation there. n plus 1, n is certainly positive. How about that? As n approaches infinity. Don't we want to know where this is less than 1, right? Isn't it always less than 1? As n gets infinitely large, this denominator gets infinitely large. x is going to be eventually overtaken by this tremendously large denominator. So this thing approaches 0, which is less than 1 all the time. So what's the interval of convergence? for all values. So it's not a certain value of x or a certain interval of values for x. It's for all x. So the interval of convergence is negative infinity to positive infinity. That means it works all the time. We're not going to have that situation like we had the other day, trying to find the inverse tangent of 2. 2 was outside of the interval of convergence. It kind of fell apart. It didn't converge. Um, so this can be used basically all the time, convergent for all values of x. Uh, we're not going to finish this today. I'm trying to think of what we can get to that. Let's mention this, and then we'll use it in our next two. 
So we're changing the terminology slightly from Taylor series, which means we're going to let it run all the way to infinity, to a Taylor polynomial. So a Taylor polynomial means we're going to truncate it at some point in time. We're going to talk about error. When, and we're definitely not talking about that today. We'll talk about that on Monday. But Taylor polynomials, if we have, let's say, um, t sub n, so it would be t sub 3, t sub 4, so it will be a certain n value that's subscripted. That will tell us not how many terms we want, because sometimes terms disappear because they have coefficients of zero. We're about to see that. But it will tell us the value for n for which we're going to stop that particular series. <coughs> so. I'm going to use n there, so I can't use it down here, so I'm going to use another letter. So from i equals 1 to n, I'm sorry, i equals 0 to n, this is our nth Taylor polynomial. Now, wherever we had n's before, we're going to have to put i's. Other than that, it's the same thing. So we had the nth order derivative. Now it's an i in that position. We had an n factorial. Now it's an i factorial. And we had an x minus a to the n. Now it's x minus a to the i. So this n is exactly the same as this one. It tells us where we're going to stop. So if we stop at n equals 3, it's a third Taylor polynomial. Stop at n equals 7, it's a seventh Taylor polynomial. Not equal to the series. There will be some error involved. Um, and we'll address that error after we get these. Let's, um, let's today get these two. I think we can get them both. Let's have a function sine of x. And we want to develop a Taylor series, I guess a Maclaurin series, for sine of x. So x minus 0 or just x to the n. Let's start at n equals 0 and let it go on forever. So this is a Taylor series. We're going to talk about some of the Taylor polynomials associated with this. But for right now, let's generate the whole series. We are going to need some higher derivatives. We'll see a pattern here. Uh, derivative of sine is cosine. Excuse me. Derivative of cosine is and derivative of negative sine is now we should start repeating, right? Derivative of negative cosine is back to sine and this same process is going to happen in cycles of four. Sine to cosine to negative sine to negative cosine, then back to sine to cosine, same thing. Cycles of four. Well, for n equals zero, we should have the zeroth derivative. We decided the zeroth derivative, although it sounds kind of stupid, is really the what? The original function at zero. over 0 factorial x to the 0. So what is the original function at 0? What was the original function? Sine of x, right? So what's the sine of 0? Zero? 0. Doesn't really matter what else I write. So the first term, there really isn't a first term that's actually going to be there to help us describe what the sine function is. Now, is this going to happen repeatedly? It's going to happen for this term, because the sine of 0 is 0. Not going to happen here. It is going to happen here. Not going to happen here. So every other term is going to be 0. Does 
that sound right? So for n equals 1, we want the first derivative at 0 over 1 factorial x to the 1. Well, what's the first derivative at 0? First derivative is cosine. What's the cosine of 0? 1 over 1 factorial x to the 1. So that looks like x to me. n equals 2, second derivative at 0 over 2 factorial x to the 2. The second derivative was negative sine of x. What's negative sine of 0? Zero? 0. We already decided that. Every other term is going to drop out. So we want the third derivative at 0, 3 factorial x to the third. The third derivative is negative cosine of x. So negative cosine of 0 is negative 1. So we have what? Negative x cubed over 3 factorial. We don't need to generate the next term because it's actually going to be what? It's going to be 0. So every other term is going to be 0. Are we going to alternate signs on the terms that remain? Well, here's the first term that's actually present is cosine of x. The next one that's actually present is negative cosine. We lose this one. What's the next one? Is cosine of x. It appears that they're going to alternate in sign, right? S-I-G-N sign. So let's leave out the zeros. It's probably not enough for the pattern yet. But if you had to wager a guess as to the next term that actually appears, we know we're going to lose the x to the fourth term, right? The next term that appears is x to the fifth. Is it going to be positive or negative? Positive. It's going to be positive. And I guess the only leap we're making is what's the denominator? What would you guess based on the pattern that we have? 5 factorial. And if we wanted to continue, this is the pattern. Does that look like a sine function? Yep. It is. Whether we think it looks like one or not, it is. This is how your calculator probably does sine functions. It's not this bright little machine. Okay, It's been stamped with this algorithm. I don't know to what power. 13th power, you can probably check your manual out. That'd be something good to do over the weekend, right? If you wake up at 5.13 in the morning, just get that calculator manual out and see how it's it, you're, you're giving me that look again. How it actually is doing sine functions or inverse tangent functions. But my guess is, is that it's doing this up to maybe x sub 13 over 13 factorial. So it's not a Taylor series, but a Taylor polynomial. This is probably going to be one of those that you're going to want to memorize. I mean, once you get the pattern going, So let's give a couple of um, memory aids before we go on to the next one. Isn't the sine an odd function? Is that correct? Sine is an odd function. What would have to be true about the sine function in order for it to be an classified as an odd function. Okay, there is no symmetry on either side of the y-axis. That would be an even function, okay, which we're going to get to that in a minute. But an odd function, symmetry to the, to the origin. So we're going to have symmetry. Okay, I like that, Jacob. You, I think you said it. 
symmetry to the origin. <coughs> and how do we test for symmetry to the origin? The f of negative x is equal to the negative of the f of x. If that's true, a couple little question marks there. If that's true, then it's an odd function. Well, the symmetry to the origin So for this point here, its symmetric image is right here on the other side of the origin. For this point here, its symmetric image is there on the, so we do have symmetry to the origin. And this is the kind of the test that creates that kind of symmetry. So is the sine of negative x, is that the negative of the sine of x? Well, just pick a value. See if that makes sense. Sine of negative pi over 6, is that the negative of the sine of pi over 6? This is a fourth quadrant angle. The sine of a fourth quadrant angle is negative. So you would take the reference angle, which is pi over 6, take the sine of the same reference angle, and just negate the value, right? Negate it because this is in the fourth quadrant, this is in the first quadrant. Same answer, this one's negative, so we better negate the first quadrant answer to make sure they're equal. It is an odd function. Is that helpful in remembering that particular power series to know, to remember that the sine is an odd function? That helps me because that's odd, that's odd, that's odd, that's odd. Everything in here is odd, right? The factorials are odd, the powers of x are odd, it's an odd function, that must be the sign. We're not gonna get the other one today, but I wanna do a quick example here. Since I brought up pi over six, we have a series, a polynomial type series for the sine function and it's x minus x cubed over 3 factorial. Well, everywhere there's an x, let's replace it with a pi over 6 and see if it works. So it should be x, which is pi over 6. You know what, I'm feeling kind of lazy today, too. I, I, I don't really want to write any more terms out. Let's just see how well we did, okay? So the sine of x is x, and I know there's a whole lot of other terms to this, But let's just stop right there. Let's just say sine of x is x. How well did we do? You'd be surprised. We actually did pretty well. What's the sine of pi over 6? I get that trig look every time we do a trig problem. That, uh, uh, uh. No. That's thir the equivalent of 30 degrees. What's the sine of 30 degrees? One half. Okay. Now, what is the number pi, which is what this side is, the number pi divided by 6? That's a little more than 3 divided by 6. 0.5236. That's not bad. We didn't have to go very far in that. Taylor series, it's a pretty good approximation already. Now, this is too much, right? So what's going to happen next? We're going to subtract some away. Let's just see by putting in the next term how much better it is. So the sine of pi over 6 on the left side is 1 half. So on the right side, we're going to use now, we're going to gather in the next term. I mean, you know what's going to happen. We're going to subtract some, but guess what? We're going to subtract too much. Therefore, we have to add some in with the next term, and that's how those things proceed. But what's pi over 6? That quantity cubed over 6, or 3 factorial, subtracted from this thing right here. Pretty good, right? That's pretty darn close to the sine of 
pi over 6, and we only use the first two terms of the Taylor series. So as you progress and gather in this term and this one, x to the 9th, x to the 11th, it's going to be very, very accurate. That is more than likely how your calculator is doing a sign problem. Whatever number you enter in, if you enter it in in radians, which this is in radians, it's going to use that value. If you enter a value in in degrees, it's going to convert that to radians so that it can use this particular power series. Now, we do have time for this. We don't have time to develop the cosine. I'm just going to write down what we have at this point thus far for the sine. Isn't the cosine the derivative of the sine? Is that correct? So you've got some things that are going to kind of connect these that you can make sure that you've memorized the right thing. We're not developing the cosine yet using the Taylor series, but let's see what we're going to get once we do that. What's the derivative of x? It's 1. What's the derivative of x cubed over 3 factorial? Well, the 3 factorial is really 1 over 3 factorial, right? That's a coefficient. And what's the derivative of x cubed? We'll simplify that in a minute. The coefficient here is 1 over 5 factorial. Derivative of x to the fifth. Coefficient here is 1 over 7 factorial. Derivative of x to the seventh. And that process is going to continue the same way. There we go. That 3 knocks our 3 factorial, which is 3 times 2 times 1. The 3's knock out, so we have 2 factorial. That process should continue. 5 factorial, the 5 and the 5 knock out, so you're left with 4 factorial. That's sounding kind of even to me. The 7. Knocks out with this 7, so you're left with 6 factorial. Here we've got an x squared. Gosh, that's looking better all the time. There's what the Taylor series or the Maclaurin series, since we're centering it at 0, is going to look like for cosine. Wouldn't it be nice if cosine were an even function? That would help you remember that. Is cosine an even function? It is. Cosine is an even function. Now, what might throw you off a little bit, I dotted my U there. Is that okay if I dot my U's? Um, the first term might throw you off in this, this whole even function thing. But if you remember, x squared over 2 factorial, x to the fourth over 4 factorial, you could really kind of back up 2 from this one. This technically is what? x to the 0 over 0 factorial. Is that right? And it's still, 0 is even, right? So it is even. Cosine is an even function. The test for something to see if it's even, it doesn't matter whether you put in an x or a negative x, you get the same thing. Is the cosine of negative pi over 6, is that the same thing as the cosine of pi over 6? Somebody justify that, and we're done for the day. Justify. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're not going to, I mean, a song won't do it. We can't sing a song, and it's justified. Where are we in this? Cosine of a fourth quadrant angle? This is cosine of a first quadrant angle? Isn't the cosine positive in the fourth quadrant and also positive in the first quadrant? Yes. If the reference angle is the same, 
it doesn't matter if you're first quadrant or fourth quadrant, the cosine is the same in both. If this had been yeah. second quadrant and third quadrant, is the cosine the same in both of those? Yes. So this is a true statement, which in all cases it's true. Cosine of x is an even function. Have a great long weekend.